Greetings, Kerbinauts. This is Kerbal Space Program. I'm Bob Fitch, and this is the Juno launch to Jupiter. I made this about two years ago, released it to my video selections about one year ago. But it was a mini-series, three episodes long, and I was thinking with Juno about to reach Jupiter, maybe it was time to do a quick recap. So this will be a short version that reintroduces you to the Juno launch. If you want to see it in excruciating detail, then follow the link below. Otherwise... But first, let's see the launch. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Ignition and liftoff from the Atlas V with Juno on a trek to Jupiter planetary piece of the puzzle on the beginning of our solar system. Pitch your roll program is in progress. Vehicle pod rates look good. Mr. P U has gone to fixed time pressure. SV chamber pressures have plateaued. I'm rolling on signatures of good RD one eighty operation. Satisfied, vehicle start on back up to full thrust. And we have solids one, two, three, four, and five jettison. Visual indication that all solids have separated well. And the booster has begun its roll for spacecraft thermal constraints. Rates look good, plus the battery voltages are stable. And the vehicle has now gone into closed loop steering. And booster PU is also on closed loop control. Engine response looks good for the set mixed ratio. Current altitude is 45.8 miles in altitude, downrange distance 69 miles. Coming up on our RCS pyro valve activation. It is now fired. Systems now pressurizing the flight levels. We've begun our two and a half G throttle segment. Engine response looks good. Current altitude is 60 miles in altitude. Downrange distance 69 miles. Velocity 5,413 miles per hour. Coming up on our next mark event will be payload frame jettison followed by the CFR jettison. And we have payload frame jettison and CFR jettison. Boosters throttled back up to full thrust. Engine response looks good. Downrange distance 118 miles. Velocity is 6,983 miles per hour. Pogo py pyro vent has been fired. Now accelerating at 4.7 G's as we work our way to our 5G throttle segment. Boost space cooldown is underway. Now throttling to maintain 5 G's. And have begun throttling to 4.6 G's in preparation for BECO. Boost space cooldown is complete. We have Beco engine shutdown looks good. 
We have retros and stage separation. We have locks and fuel pre-start. RCS Gen 2 purge firing is underway. We have ignition and full thrust on the RL-10. Centaur closed loop steering has been enabled. Small body rates associated with closed loop steering. Vehicle tank pressures are being ramped down as expected. Centaur PU has been commanded to oxidizer rich fixed angles for the early part of this six minute and two second burn. Current altitude is 112 miles. Downrange distance is 589 miles. Velocity is 14,318 miles per hour. Range track shows the vehicle right down the middle of the corridor, making excellent progress. And there we go. We're up there pretty high now. We're just circularizing our orbit. So I'm going to begin talking about Juno just a bit. Juno was part of NASA's New Frontiers program. It was a mission to Jupiter that was launched from Cape Canaveral in August of 2011. It was expected to arrive in July of 2016. So as of the making of this video, they still haven't gotten there. The mini-series version of this launch will show you a lot about how I constructed that payload. It was about 180 parts, as I recall, with most of them being custom-crafted by me, using models and textures from other mods and bringing them together to make the payload. I created all the configuration files that set up all the stats for all the parts to make them perfectly identical to the actual Juno mission. It has the exact same sizes and masses of everything, all the same instruments, all the science, everything, even the power, it all worked exactly the same. I had gotten to calling this my ship in a bottle. You know how when people make ships and they make them built inside a bottle and they have every little detail perfect? Well, that's what this one was to me. I had the most fun crafting every little bit and piece of this. But as I said, all of that is in the mini-series version. This version is just going to give you the recap. The Centaur has finished orbital insertion and we're getting lined up for our exit burn. I won't be giving any details about the launcher, not the Atlas V or the Centaur, but I will cover the Juno a bit, although it will be highly condensed. In fact, let's take a look at that right now. So we'll start with the Juno Electronics Vault. The vault is about 180 kilograms of shielding protecting 20 kilograms of instruments and holds the heart of the spacecraft. The walls are one centimeter thick titanium to protect it against Jupiter's intense radiation. One of these hexagonal structures and put the core strut that will go down the middle and provide the conduits right in here where fuel can flow from the fuel tanks that we'll be attaching in a moment down to the engine right through there. Putting another one down here on the bottom like this. The inner panels are 10 kilograms each and go in like this. But we'll symmetry these to have six of them. Next we'll attach a couple fuel tanks. We have hydrazine tanks and we'll be placing four of those and then we'll grab these oxidizer tanks and again symmetry that so there's two of them opposite each other right here and now we have all six fuel tanks using a normal squad fuel pipe we'll just run it in like that to represent the Juno helium bottles that were used to pressurize those tanks we'll just throw those right down underneath here when originally making this, I didn't know where the helium was, but now, a couple years after making it, I think that they're in the middle because I saw a video that showed an x-ray view of the interior and they look something like this. We need to put an engine down on the bottom, so we'll be using this Lyros 1B engine right here. Well, I welded an AIES engine right there inside a docking port because I figured the shield on that looked similar to the shielding that I'm supposed to have on this engine. For communications up top, we're going to go with this Juno HGA. There we go. This will serve not just as the communications back to Earth, but also as part of a gravity science experiment. I've been asked in to help with the gravity science experiment. Measuring Jupiter's gravity depends on measuring changes in the spacecraft velocities that goes around Jupiter. What we're looking at sort of there are many segments in the miniseries version of this where the scientists who really worked on these instruments describe what they do. For the sake of brevity, I'm cutting those out in this condensed version, but if you'd like to see them, go check out the miniseries or look online at the Juno website. 
I would symmetry these all the way around the outside, six of those, and flip them up to cover up that interior. If we were inside looking in here, we could see all of these little pipes and cables running through the interior. Well, here's my Juno main battery. Juno had a couple of these placed on the outside right along in here. For the solar panels, I have some special joints that I got out of Infernal Robotics. So the base obviously would go right here. Juno Solar Hinge Middles and put that down on the bottom. So here's a Juno Solar Middle and that would go on right here. This piece is the magnetometer and it sticks out from the last solar panel. For the solar panels, once those backing pieces were down, which would then go on this panel sort of like that. Here's a good look at the solar panels being tested by the scientists. They're helping to support them since they're in gravity right now and obviously in space they wouldn't be. First, let's go down here and take a look at where the waves instrument would be. I had two waves rotators where I put one on this side and one on this side and then took these Juno waves antennas, grab that and put that on the rotator and then just spun it around until it was lined up nicely going along the bottom right here. Jumping ahead to just after finishing the construction of the solar panels, which was a little bit too tedious for all the steps to show you them one by one. You can see that I have that last part of the waves instrument right there. I'm going to want to simulate having wires. For now, the positions are going to look fairly random, but as I put more science instruments in on the top, they will start to make more sense and look like they're connecting various things together. Before we do the last science instruments, let's take a look at the last bits of the communications, propulsions, and orientations. Juno medium gain antenna and forward low gain antenna. It goes down here on the side of the electronics vault, something like that. We also have the RCS we need to put on up here. We have the top Juno RCS, each side of the upper structure here. We have the long one that comes up like this, and then a copy of that gets taken, flipped around, and put on this side right over here. Stick one copy there, and then copy that and put one on the other side as well. Just like that right there. So the Juno Advanced Stellar Compass right here comes up and goes right in this location. We just have to rotate it into the correct orientation to have it right here, pointing out and watching the stars to make sure we know where we are at all times. We have this toroidal low gain antenna we take that one and we put that down here on the bottom right about there and we have the aft low gain antenna and that one goes right in here. The basic structure of the satellite is complete so now we just have science instruments to place around the outside of it. Juno MWR, the microwave radiometer extra large one right here which would take up an entire side. We have just a large one that would take up only a portion of a side. Then there's medium which would go somewhere right around here small which would go underneath it and very small goes up here right on the edge right about there tiny MWR sensor that was supposed to go right here measures the radiation in the, in the microwave region now that sounds like other instrument the magnetometer has this SHM the scalar helium magnetometer it's an extra little bit that was an independent science instrument that goes right down on there the ultraviolet imaging Spectrograph. Once again, that is a couple welded bits, and those are going to go over here. Ultraviolet spectrograph. It's uh, an instrument that looks at ultraviolet light, light you can't see with your eyes. It, it's too short a wavelength. It's the Juno Cam. It sits embedded inside the craft like this. Juno Cam is on the spacecraft to take pictures of Jupiter, and we specifically designed it. Our next instrument is going to be called the Juno Jedi. We need to place three of those. One of them will go over here. Another goes on its side at a different point as if in a triangle over here on this corner of the surface of the craft. And then the last one will go normal side up, looking off of this last side. Uh, it's the Jupiter Energetic Particle Detector Instrument, and the acronym does not quite work out properly, but somebody loved the word Jedi for obvious reasons. We affectionately call her... In the case of Jade, I once again welded multiple pieces together, but shrunk them down super small to make them look like a science instrument. Our hamster wheel sort of instrument will go over here, and then we have three jade instruments that are going to look out the three different sides of Juno. So we'll place one right here, and one right here, and one right here. 
Jade, the Jovian Auroral Dynamics Experiment, is a set of instruments that measures the electrons and ions. Those are particles charged very... This is the GIRUM instrument. I'm going to put a little integrator box up here on top of the satellite where all the wires are coming together. And then down below, put the instrument itself, which is another hull cam embedded in a lackluster brick. A Jupiter infrared aurora mapper is an image spectrometer. At the beginning, it was meant for supporting auroral observations to make images of aurora, and at the same time... We're generating just under 100 kilonewtons of force from our workhorse, the RL-10 engine. It's not much, but with an ISP and vacuum of almost 450 seconds, powered by liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen, we can get a lot of delta V out of this stage. And yet, still not enough to get us all the way to Jupiter, and that's why we're going to be swinging around after one orbit and a deep space maneuver to align our trajectory with Earth, where we can do a gravity slingshot assist that will send us the rest of the way to Jupiter. The first stage had burned about four and a half minutes, and then the first burn of the Centaur was about six minutes. After that, we coasted for 30. So after this second Centaur burn, we'll still only be less than an hour into our flight, this epic journey that's going to take years to get to its destination. That nine minute burn is coming to a close very soon. We can see as our elliptical orbit around the Earth is extending further and further away until finally it pops and we have to go out, zoom out here, scroll to where we can see our orbit extending now out past Mars. This will go until that centaur is completely devoid of any fuel. We're even using our RCS system to get a little extra push, even though it's a tiny bit. We're only going to save enough to give Juno a spin before we release it. Juno is spin stabilized, but rather than using any of the fuel from Juno itself, we're going to take advantage of the fact that we're still attached to the Centaur. Spin that up to 1.4 revolutions per minute, and then we can decouple it and let it go on its way. After decoupling, that centaur will just drift endlessly in interplanetary space going around the sun. Maybe someday some high-tech humans will go out and salvage it, put it in a museum as a relic from a couple thousand years before their time. Now we will slowly open up the solar panels, which will, due to the conservation of angular momentum, actually reduce our spin down by two-thirds. But once they're open, we can start to recharge our batteries. Here at Earth, there is much more sun than there will be at Jupiter, so that should happen fairly quickly. I'm also going to deploy my waves instrument now, just to give it a little test before we get to Jupiter and find out that it doesn't work or something. You can see that extending down there off the bottom. The WAVES instrument is basically a radio. It tunes to frequencies all the way from 50 hertz, which is near the bottom of the audio frequency range, up to above 40 megahertz, which is above... And here we are, happily spinning along as we're leaving the Earth, waving goodbye and zipping off into deeper space. Soon we'll be setting up our first deep space maneuver that will help us with our Earth gravity assist. Days and then weeks and then months are zipping by now as we zoom ahead in our orbit to where we're going to be making our deep space maneuver that will help us with that gravity assist. The Leros engine wasn't designed to be run for a whole hour, but that's how long we need to fire. So what we're going to do is split this up into two burns of 30 minutes each. The first one is at the end of August, about a year after launching and the second burn a couple weeks after that in September. Each burn being roughly about the same is changing the velocity by three to 400 meters per second using three to 400 kilograms of fuel. We've used our RCS system to rotate ourselves into the correct orientation. We've opened up the shield on the Leros engine, and now we're firing it up, getting started on the first of those 30 minute long engine burns. Yes, I really did run this for 30 minutes. I just set a stopwatch and went off and got a sandwich and came back later and the burn was almost done. Our Leros 1B is still plugging away, doing its 635 or so newtons. 
The thrust range on that is anywhere from 587 to 707, but we're not going to be running it at full power. Anyway, the first 30 minutes are just about up, and at that point we can set up a maneuver node that will put us on a trajectory to do that flyby two weeks from now. Well, the deep space maneuver number two is two weeks from now, but the flyby itself will be in another year. You can see the path right there that we're hoping to take after deep space maneuver number two, and if all works out correctly, notice over here we'll be making a Jupiter intercept. We'll jump ahead two weeks now, and it's time for the second deep space maneuver. We're opening up the shield on the Leros 1B, firing it up to about 90, 95% of our thrust capacity, and beginning our second 30 minute long maneuver. Like before, I set up the maneuver, went away for about 25 minutes and came back later, watched the last five of it, and refined my approach in toward Jupiter. Just like with the first burn, I set it up, went away, came back, and let it finish. You can see me here as I'm watching that close approach marker on the far right there. As it gets closer and closer and then finally creates an encounter, at which point I zoom in really close and fine tune things, which is really easy to do with this Leros engine because it has such a low thrust. Zooming in here, we can see how our path is going to be crossing Earth's path picking up that extra velocity and then zooming out, we can now see how that gravity assist is helping us up toward Jupiter. And there it is, the Jupiter Intercept. Dun, da, da, da. Now we can close up our Leros engine. We won't be needing that anymore. And we can begin our one year long journey back to where we started from, back to Earth. Except this time we're going to be getting something else once we're there again. That fabulous extra couple thousand meters per second of Delta V. When we reach Jupiter, you're going to see that the planet looks green instead of looking like real Jupiter. That's because two years ago, that's how it looked when you were playing in real solar system. It wasn't until later that Jupiter looked like Jupiter. Oh, it's time. You can see that teal solar orbit is getting shorter. And there we go. We have crossed over onto the brown. Now the teal orbit is going past Earth. It's time for our gravity assist slingshot maneuver past the Earth picking up the Delta V we need to head out to Jupiter, and sure enough, we go out to the map and we have been flung straight toward that gorgeous planet. We launched in 2011, now it's 2013, about two years later, and we're making our flyby. Our arrival at Jupiter is projected for July of 2016. We're targeting a polar orbit around Jupiter for a couple reasons. One, it gives us a really good look at the planet. We'll be looping around it 33 times, and each time getting a different look, alternating which science instruments we'll be using as we take our look through each one. Our other main reason is it'll help us avoid any long-term exposure to the high radiation generated from Jupiter. That radiation could damage our instruments even though we are protecting them in a vault, we are not immune. Everything outside the vault is vulnerable too. The insertion burn will go through the close approach to Jupiter. The engine will burn for about 30 minutes, capturing into a 107 day, very elliptical orbit. But this will allow us to save fuel by doing a period reduction burn later. About seven to eight days in, we'll do a little cleanup burn to make sure we're aligned correctly. Then when we're swinging back around again, we'll reduce the overall orbit down to just 11 days. No science will be done on these initial orbits. The first couple are just to check out all of our systems and make sure everything is ready for the real science orbits that will begin on the third time around. We have almost finished our 30 minute long, 107 day capture orbit burn. After that, as I mentioned earlier, we'll do some systems checks and then we'll swing around, go through that close approach one more time, bringing down to that 11 day orbit. And then for orbits three through 33, we're going to do different types of science for the next year. Every time through, we're going to spin around to make sure the craft is pointed the right direction to get all the science instruments where they need to be. Take our readings, and then as we leave, shifting back again so that the high gain antenna can send that science back to Earth, capturing it with our 70 meter dish from the Deep Space Network. 
each of the science orbits is only going to get to do some of the instruments as they go through. It's already been mapped out and planned exactly which orbits are going to be for which instruments. For the gravity science experiments, we need to have the high gain antenna pointed at Earth so that we can compare data between Earth and the satellite. Most of the orbits are going to be for the gravity science, but some of them will allow the microwave radiometer to work. For that, the instruments need to be pointed at the planet, and that means the high gain antenna will not be pointed at Earth, and therefore we cannot do the gravity experiments for those few orbits. But that's only a few of them. It's orbits 2, 4, 5, 6, and 7. All the rest of them are going to be gravity science orbits. Every other instrument can function regardless of how it's oriented. So we will get data from everything else no matter what. Then, ultimately, after a whole year going around Jupiter, after all the science has been collected, we will deorbit the spacecraft, sending it into Jupiter to be destroyed. We don't want it to accidentally collide with any of Jupiter's moons and contaminate it now, do we? So that will be the end of it then, on October 16th, 2017. It will all come to an end. And so that's it. Until next time, I will see you later, Kerbinauts.